That seems kind of fun, isn't it? All right. So got mobilization with the oh, what's the big super battleship? What was that called? Yeah, dreadnoughts. What's the biggest killer in war though? Artillery, high explosive artillery. And so we got right here and attack France first. Everybody's ready to attack. And this is something that I can't emphasize this enough. The civilian governments and a lot of the generals too, they didn't realize what game they were playing. You know, it was still like a game, like they're moving pieces on a board and they didn't understand what was happening. Well, the German plan is gonna be called the Schlieffler plan. And so the Schlieffler plan, Eric von Schlieffler was the head of the great German general staff. And he had been the, um, he was there for eight years and he worked on this plan. It was basically this. Okay, Switzerland, two mountainous, can't go through there. The French army is here. In fact, the French plan was called Plan 17. I know, a clever name. Was to attack right here. That gap between where Alsace and Lorraine were. And so the Germans are going to go around through Belgium and Luxembourg. Luxembourg, they, they took Luxembourg. What could Luxembourg do? But the plan was originally to put 90% of the German army, to eventually go down to about 75%, in a massive right hook that would sweep through Belgium. In fact, the idea was the last man on the right, their sleeve will brush the English Channel. Overwhelming force through Belgium, sweep around Paris, and defeat the French army right there on the Marne River. That was the plan. And if the French do attack, let them come. Even if they take some land, that will help our plan because their main army is back to us and they'll have to retreat. But the whole thing is counting on this, that it would take at least six weeks for the Russian army, it's referred to a lot as the steamroller because it was so big, to come pouring into here. So the plan was to feed them in less than six weeks, and then take this army, put them on trains, go across Germany and destroy Russia. That's the plan. And it's an incredibly risky plan. This is all or nothing. If there's no going back, if they're slowed up in France, it's over. So with that, it's a very risky plan. But it looked good on the map. And von Schlieffen worked on it, his staff worked on it, we tired, he still worked on it for the last two years of his life. Yes. And, and by 1911, you're right, because by 1911, Bosch Huthman himself realized it won't work. It would just be a massive traffic jam here. There's not enough roads. They won't be able to get supplies. How do you fight, march, and fight an exhausted men then? Turn around and march back to the railheads, then go across here. Won't work. And they tinkered with it, played with it, would work. The thing is, they didn't have anything else. So that's their plan. This should be some plan. Mobilization, attack France through Belgium. The French plan, mobilize, attack here. The Russian plan, mobilize and attack here and here. The Austrian plan, either attack all of the Serbia or split. They didn't have enough men to do either. Really. The British plan, block it. And those have all these plans. Boom, mobilize, go. So, here are the plans going in. And there were a few conflicts. There was near war over Morocco, between Germany and France in 1907, 1908. There were two Balkan wars down here, but fortunately, at least at the time, it didn't erupt into, they literally said, not into, it didn't erupt into the apocalypse. There's a war between Italy and the, they took Libya from the Ottoman Empire. There are a few wars, but relative peace. And anarchists were uh, committing terrorist attacks, but they weren't alone. The Balkans were still a crisis. It had been a crisis for this entire time. It's known as the Balkan power case since the 1870s. All these different groups in these multicultural empires, these countries had fought their way out 
of the Ottoman Empire. Two wars here. But the big thing was Serbia was incredibly aggressive and reckless with intriguing in, into Austria. Russia supported them, but Russia didn't want anything else because they didn't like Austria. And this is from 1880, the Balkan Troubles, trying to tap it down, the great powers, knowing that war will erupt there sometime. And it would happen in a thing that wasn't as, a, it, it was not that unusual, an assassination. Remember, there are assassinations all the time. The assassination of the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Ferdinand's uncle had been the emperor, the Kaiser of Austria, since 1848. In fact, he wouldn't die till, 18, until 1916, Franz Joseph. For me? All right, I'm out of here. Yes. Was it the ammunition list in the late 20th century? No. But there was a band called that. And so, with that, and uh, so with that, uh, where are we at? Oh. oh, I forgot. So he was going down to Sarajevo. Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia today. Austria just annexed this area right here, and they've been governing for 30 years, called Bosnia. Russia was mad, didn't do anything in 1908, now they're still mad. So the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne was going down to Sarajevo, and Serbia saw their chance. They wanted to commit an act of terrorism, and they didn't care if it succeeded or not, it was just the act of terrorism. There was a group of Bosnian nationalists that Serbia was organizing called the Black Hand. And generically, this Slavic nationalist group that wanted to break away from Austria, of course, Serbia is saying, become part of Serbia. The Black Hand is a really common name. A lot of different like revolutionary groups or even organized criminal help, organized crime unions called the Black Hand. For example, the United States, there was a a group of extortionists called the Black Hand. Dip your hand in some kind of tar, leave a handprint, creep in here, you know, that kind of thing. It's a warning. Yes. Uh, I, I think you remember reading the point that Sam claimed one member of the Black Hand participated in the assassination that took a signed dying bill, but he expired, so he ended up being a little Yeah, we're not quite to that part of the story yet, but yes. And the Serbian secret police, yeah, that's kind of what happened. They, they, they're deciding. And the Serbian secret police was organizing the Black Hand. They're arming him, giving him weapons, giving him sanctuary in Serbia. They want these terrorist attacks. And then they go find sanctuary in Serbia, infuriating the Austrians. Well, Gabriel Prince was one of the assassins. And they, he was chosen. For a couple different reasons. As a very, he was still only 18, you know, young man, and he wanted to join the Serbian army, but he had a combination of he was too small and he had tuberculosis. And this fit in with all the rest of the volunteers. They all, they tried to get all of them with tuberculosis. Why? They're already condemned. They're already going to die. So you know, they will be less likely to. Bombs, probably doing not as many inhibitions. They all have consumption. So they're going to die sometime from it. Tuberculosis was a death sentence. And Princey. And so they knew he was coming on the 28th. And the motorcade was going to go through the main road, the Apple Clay, down the middle of Sarajevo to the courthouse. We're going to have a ceremony and a state lunch. And so six assassins and one person kind of an overall command was going to be there. They were all armed with pistols, they had a little vial of cyanide, a little glass vial with a little cork in it. And the idea was if they're captured, they're going to bite that glass. 
and that would kill them. So they wouldn't, before they could tell the story. Serbia did not want every, uh, them to know that uh, Serbian secret police were behind them. They would carry papers from Serbia. They had just been to Serbia. They were tied to Serbia. This was a reckless and amateurish operation. A few of them had hand grenades. We had a kind of a little rip cord where you pull the cord and that would light a fuse. The friction would light a fuse and so it would smoke and then explode. So a, a relatively primitive hand grenade, even for then it was relatively primitive. And so the motorcade went by. The first assassin either didn't shoot or lost their nerve, but the second assassin ripped through the bomb, but it was smoking. The driver saw it, hit the gas. It hit the back trunk of the of Ferdinand's and his wife's car, bounced underneath the car behind it and exploded, wounding two Austrian officers. Well, then all hell broke. The cameras running around, and they drove as quickly as they could through town. The other assassins either did not have time or lost their nerve in the panic. Some began to run away. Some tried to flee across a river that was only about knee deep. Just chaos. And they started rounding people up and arresting them. And yes, a few of them were captured. A few of them tried to get the cyanide out. One did bite it, but it was so old and the cork didn't really seal it. They just got really sick. Rincey, though, who was right here, seeing the panic, he did not panic. He walked across the street walked across the street, started heading this way, and then did something he thought was very natural. I think it's very amusing. He's walking along. Oh, it was a delicatessen. He went in and got a sandwich. I find that really funny. Now, he's trying to act natural. But of course, how, how, what else would a natural, normal person who's not an assassin do if there's been an assassination attempt in front of you? What's your first thought? I'm hungry. <laughs> Yeah, you know, if he would have just like joined the panic, yeah, that would have made more sense. But he kind of hid out in the delicatessen. Arthur went here, yell at the mayor, how dare you not have good security. Cut short the ceremony, and the plan was to get him out of town and go a different route. But he wanted to go to the hospital to visit the two, so, two officers who were hurt. That's down this way. Now, the original plan was to go through the middle of the downtown on Franz Joseph Street. Franz Joseph, that was the, the Kaiser Bazaar. I mean, the uh, Emperor. But now they're just going to go straight through. But the car leading the procession, the motorcade, either got confused or didn't know and turned. Ferdinand's car and Ferdinand and his wife followed. They realized their mistake, hit the brake. Guess where they were in front of? Exactly in front of what? And that deli out box princess, and they're literally just two feet away, four feet away from him, is Franz Ferdinand. And he, without even thinking, he pulled out his revolver and started opening fire. Ended up killing both Ferdinand and his father. In fact, he is still trying to fire as guards are wrestling in front. Now, if you're not clear, let me show you a very, a pretty amazingly accurate animation of this. Are you ready? This is going to kind of blow you away. So this bomb, then drive back. Let's see it again. Can you guess which car is Franz Ferdinand? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It could be any car, right? So good. I like how their assassins are stalled. Yes. Wait, my sandwich. They had his priority swear. There he is actually being wrestled away. And some of the and most of the uh, assassins were executed. They were caught with Serbian papers, Serbian, some had Serbian passports. Some were tied directly to the Serbian secret police. The pistols they were carrying had Serbian uh, registration on them. It was such an amateurish job. Serbia is implicated. 
I should add that Ferdinand, there's the picture of the assassination, Fer, or, uh, Princey, they decided to hold off on the trial because he was too young to execute under Austrian law. So they were going to wait till after Austria won the war and do a show trial the next. So they held him in prison. Ironically, he would die in early 1918 out of Kansas. So he died. And so with that, you can imagine what happened. Everyone's furious, absolutely furious at Serbia. Even Russia, their ally, was disgusted by Serbia's action. And Russia basically let it not be known through their embassy to Vienna. If you want to do some kind of reprisal, some kind of attack against Serbia, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but as punishment for this, we won't mind. Just some kind of minor little attack. But Serbia did, but Austria didn't. And you can imagine as the weeks went by, things kind of calmed down. But all across Austria were reprisals. And hundreds of Slavic nationalists, anybody who had a tie to Slavic revolutionaries or just rounded up in the, in the theory after the assassination would be executed. Here are hundreds of Slavs executed by Austrians. And all of these are both are different types of the same kind of hanging machine. They have a little pulley and ratchet where you clip the ratchet and it pulls them up slowly to their feet off the ground and slowly strangles. This is not like an ex like a hanging where they you have a trap door and a brake circle. This is slow terrorism. So they wanted this to be seen. Now let me ask you something. With a black hand. And the Serbian secret police and those who wanted the revolutions in Austria, were they happy or sad that Austria started killing all these slums? Very happy. They wanted Austria to overreact. So the Slavs came mad and revolt. They wanted a crackdown. And this also shows you one of the huge problems inherent problems with terrorism outside the actual act of terror. The people who do it sometimes want horrible actions to follow. They want this hell so there's a revolution. They wanted innocent Slav to be killed. And so this is kind of one of the scary things about actions like this. But this is going to happen in my lifetime, but indirectly in your lifetime. So when Al-Qaeda attacked the United States on September 11, 2001, this totally improbable attack that somehow worked shouldn't have. So many chances, so many times it shouldn't have worked. They wanted the United States to go wandering into Afghanistan. They wanted the United States to have a big presence over there. They couldn't believe how lucky they were that the United States attacked Iraq, which had nothing to do with the September 11th attack. They wanted that. Now, you can argue that's psychopathic, but. They wanted that reaction. Yeah. They wanted the proof that the United States was an imperial power bent on domination, destruction of the religion, and then they get to the Beijing to take all of it. Uh, well, it was a disaster for everyone involved. That's pretty safe to say. And we're leading to what's going to be called the July crisis, because this is going to be one of the weirder months in history. So the month started with fear of this might escalate to full scale war. Austria didn't attack. Things calmed down. People were calm. But in Vienna, there's intrigue. In Vienna, there's talk of doing more. Well, the first thing is Austria now is saying, we don't just want to punish Serbia. Even though I wrote punish Serbia, write down, we want to destroy Serbia. Let's knock them out. So I wrote down punish and I realized I should have been more, more strenuous. Destroy, devastate. They want to make sure that Serbia will never be a threat. Austria is weak and they know it. So they, this is an opportunity for them to knock out Serbia. And so they'll hold on a little bit longer. Now, this is not necessarily good policy, but that's what they're thinking in Vienna. 
The problem is, if they go all out against Serbia, this might bring boom into the war. Russia. So they got to go to their only ally. Who's the only ally of the Austrians? They go to Germany, and Germany, their civilian government responds with, do what you want, we got your back, don't worry about it. The Chancellor Bathman Cookman basically said, don't worry, we got you. Germany, their Chancellor and the Kaiser both believe it would just be a reprisal, a punishment attack, and nothing more. Make Austria a little bit stronger, we have no choice. In fact, they were so unconcerned that all the civilian government went on vacation. This, the Kaiser himself went on a yacht and sailed the fjords of Norway. He did that in 20 hours, July and August. That's how unconcerned they were. But the chief of the, of the Austrian general staff, Conrad, and the chief of the great German general staff in Berlin kept talking. And von Molke, the head of the German army, he is sitting there. This is him right here. He's sitting there in Berlin, sending messages down to his counterpart in Austria. Attack. Von Moltke wants war. And not just a minor attack. He's trying to convince the Austrians to commit all their forces and not serve He's basically saying, we got your back on Russia. Don't worry about it. Attack Serbia. Knock them out. Now, part of it is to make Austria stronger, but Von Moltke's looking at the numbers. Russia's industrializing. Slowly but surely, France is already really powerful. If Russia keeps getting stronger, Germany is going to be strong somewhere. Someday, they'll get us. Our best chance is now. Every day we wait, we get weaker. So Von Molke is doing it, and the Austrians decide to do it. We're going to attack. And so everything's calming down. And then the last week of July, literally like a thunderbolt, Austria says, to Serbia, you've committed an act of war on us, and you must either follow these 10 points of an ultimatum, every single one, or we go to war. So a 10-point ultimatum, and right here it's called the brutal tenure of the Austro-Hungarian note. And these 10 points were designed that no country could ever agree to. Basically, Serbia had to give up their sovereignty or their control over their own country control of their army, their secret police, control everything. A 10-point ultimatum. No way Serbia would agree to it. In fact, they gave them 48 hours, and they issued it on a Friday afternoon with the idea of being able to go into Friday, into Saturday, into Sunday. You know, so you know, Serbia would think they're getting ready for the weekend, the beginnings of what's called the weekend. And, but Russia, everyone else begs Serbia. We don't want war. We don't want war. Please agree. France, who doesn't relax Serbia, the same thing. Don't do, just agree. So Serbia agrees kind of to not. They put caveats, but they, in essence, agree. Actually, kind of amazing they did this. Basically, it showed you how embarrassed Serbia was and how alone. But nine is not ten. Yes. That's pretty close. It was essentially they had to give up their police force to Austria. Give up control of their police to Austria, which is basically giving them sovereignty. So that's basically a foot rest. That's a good point. So what does Austria do? They declare war at the end of the month. Russia says, how dare you do this? A month earlier, if it would have been a minor attack, Russia would have been over. Now, no. We'll give you 24 hours to drop your declaration of war, or Russia will do what? But they can't attack until they do what? And so they mobilized. And once they mobilized, von Molke went back to the Kaiser, who arrived, cut his trip short, basically right back to Berlin. Like, what's going on? And von Molke goes to the Kaiser and says, Russia's mobilized. We have to do what? If Germany mobilizes, and let's remember, if Germany mobilizes, that means they attack whom? And like that. It's actually pretty scary, isn't it? 
Talk about this bumbling mess of the war. Last call. Yes. Yeah, it would be kind of difficult. The thing was, it also showed you how he just, he basically lost interest in that leadership. Yeah. Yeah, the, the last factor was uh, was militarism and violence. And then we talk about the other things. Think about the other I guess I should have been more clear on that. I didn't want to be. And so I like this cartoon. Serbia, you make a move. Hey, you hit that little fella or you strike my friend. And I like at the very end, hey, there, there's Britain coming in at the end. I know you want to see an easy diagram to show how this happens. So here's a very easy diagram to follow. This should sum it up pretty quickly. So, are you good? We're cool. We got it. All right. So then Vietnam. Okay. So headlines from the day. Okay. I showed you an Onion article before about the wild boar. Remember that? The best part about satire is there's an element of truth. And that's pretty close to the truth, isn't it? I don't know if Ottoman Empire was declares war on itself. Nations struggle to remember allies. The map is pretty funny. <laughs> Area drunkard declares war on Ireland. But my personal favor, assassination of Archduke spreads fear at Archduke Convention. <laughs> so, with that, but let's look at a real. It's not much different, is it? That's real. It's about the same. All of a sudden, we're all at war. And so Germany mobilizes. And what does that mean? On August 1st, they make an ultimatum to, to Belgium. Here we come. You got 24 hours. Open the door. And then, oh, here's another one of those maps in. So here's the steamroller. This is British, though. So you notice the dachshund and the British bulldog came over and bit its nose. French. The Italy with looks like a like a squid, <laughs> and then uh, there's uh, Turkey with or the Ottomans, but they're and that's supposed to be Germans helping. Uh, I like uh, Norway and Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> so August fourth is considered the date that war begins, and the reason why is. Austria did attack Serbia. I should for, I should tell you, everyone forgot about Serbia. Except for the poor Serbians. And oh, before I forget, Serbia beat Austria badly. It failed. The whole thing, Austria puts a this this mobility. But back to this. So August 4th is considered the day because of this. On the first, Germany declared. War on France, but also gave an ultimatum to Belgium. 24 hours. Belgium refused, said, we'll fight. Germany declares war. Britain said, you got 24 hours. If you, got a, you can't attack Belgium. Germany, of course, ignores that. Germany assumed the war would be over before the powerful British Navy could have any influence. And Britain declared war, August 4th. That's when it's considered war. And so that's why I put down the very brief little Germany to Belgium, Belgium to UK. That's how it got in. Once Britain entered the war, it became World War. Now we have colonial actions. The mighty Royal Navy is everywhere. We'll be fighting. So they're soon going to be fighting in Africa. They'll be fighting in China. They'll be fighting in the Pacific. This is a worldwide war overnight. It was known very quickly as the Great War. And then the World War. And then on September 1st, 1939, it's shocking how fast this happened. It became known as World War I. That should also tell you is that new war is going to be called World War II right away. I mean, just boom, overnight. They're like desperate for the name. And it just happened so fast. And the blundering to war. Everybody thought they were fighting a just and defensive and I like this picture. See everyone blaming everybody else. Here's Italy watching and waiting because Italy said, since Austria was not attacked, we're not going to join our triple alliance. And they would 
join the other side. But you notice the piece of Europe with the knight on the heart. So that's a pretty good cartoon, pretty clever. But everybody said they were fighting a defensive war. In fact, only one of the great powers entered this war, or only one of the great powers didn't have a choice in entering this war. Everybody else had a choice. What's the only country that didn't have a choice? Who? Serbia. Of the great powers. Oh. And Serbia had a choice. Remember, they did the assassination. Right. France is the only one who didn't have a choice. Everybody else made a decision to join. But Germany saw this as a preventative war. Germany, I told you von Mulkey's thinking, our enemies are getting stronger. And someday, they'll attack. Huh? Yeah, the day. And someday, so we must be ready. And if we wait next year, Russia will be stronger. We'll wait next year, Russia and France is stronger. And with Britain pulling closer to them, they're coming. They're coming. So let's do it now. A preemptive strategy is you attack right before the enemy's like, they're, they're massing and you attack. This is not what Germany did. Germany, you know, for von Molke, but allowed by the Kaiser in that system of government, they attack because someday. Now, does anyone in here know the future? If you do, let's talk lottery numbers. And <laughs> well, the point is we don't know. So you're just making that up. By definition, in fact, not only by definition, by treaty and therefore law for the United States, the treaty the U.S. entered the United Nations in, preventative war is a war of aggression and a war of power. So couldn't you just make up any preventative reason to go to war? Anybody want to guess Russia's reason? Ukraine was allying themselves with the alliance, the alliance of Europe and the United States against them and run to a town. By the way, what is the American alliance that created in the Cold War? It's still there. So Europe, NATO. Was that true? NATO was expanding. You could argue Russia might have been upset about this, but no, it's completely not true. We just wanted. And so, yes. Well, we're not we're not time to talk about it. Sometimes. And with that, remember the Civil War? Isn't this exactly the reason the South gave for secession? We got to do it now because that Republican Party is going to get stronger. And someday they'll do something. And everybody knew secession meant war. They knew it in 1861. Same reason. So, last thing for today, I'll let you work on the map. How do the people of, both, of all these countries react when the mobilization calls are running? How? I think they made all the going to the ones that are great because they do what was coming. No, they were overjoyed. A sense of euphoria overturned them. We're going to war. They were so happy. Now France could finally take care of the hated Germans. Germany could wipe out their enemies. On to Berlin, the call was. Here are enthusiastic Russians outside the summer palace in St. Petersburg. Here's Russian or Ger uh, French cavalry going through Paris, being given flowers as they go through. By the way, look at the cavalry. This is 1914. They have machine guns and heavy artillery, and they look like they're cavalry from the 18th century. They got breastplates and plumes in their helmets. Um, here's French soldiers going off to the war. And they're the, uh, on the trains to take them to the front. It says, on to Berlin. So many British volunteered that it shut the economy down. Because so many young men didn't want to miss out on the fun. Germans, a euphoria took over. It's hard to describe. Finally, Germans can show their superiority of their culture. The anti-war socialist Democrats, Democratic Party, that we must defeat our enemies. Look at the flowers in Harris to say goodbye to his wife. Going off to war. March into the railway station, see the flowers, flowers in their guns. Kind of remarkable. Be given be be food on the way on to Paris. Yeah. Are we still like doing like just going out in the law yet? So were they just like watching? Watching. And uh, 
two children. And uh, two going to make a lot of money on trade. A lot. Yes. Well, your war has always been around us. Still is. You know, this town almost called the Berorian. And especially the young people, you know, younger, it's true. I, I know this when I was younger, and it just changed as you get older. This idea you want to get, want to be something bigger than yourself, give back. The idea that you're going to fight for something bigger is a really powerful feeling. And also to get away from home. But war was really romanticized. And the reality of war is still hidden today. People romanticize war now. And look at all the people running around playing soldier now. And they do it all the time. So you know that. But then I should have 1939. They're, they remember. Okay. Oh, you want to see one more thing really quick? Oh, these are young men. If they if their draft card and come, they let them off and roll in the ass. I show you one more thing in Munich. There was a big celebration. Look at the crowd in Munich. And after the war, this little group, it was a political party to be exact, found their leader right here in the crowd. It was an Aust he was an Austrian immigrant who fled Austria to avoid the Austrian military draft, but in the euphoria joined the Bavarian army. That is, of course, home. And Hitler would go on to become a war hero, an enlisted man. He'd run messages. There he is. He'd be awarded the Iron Cross twice for bravery. I should add, to run medals, you have to be not only very quick, you have to be a master of disguise. So Hitler was able to avoid the gun. You see Hitler? Everywhere Hitler went, this should have been a warning. Big cross is over his head. Don't. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Somebody put a little piece of tape on it to mark it. That's Hitler right there. You see a problem with that mustache? When they started using chemical weapons, those big mustaches they were, and that was the style, the big handlebar mustaches, they got away at the seal, the gotten away at the seal of the gas masks. And so soldiers started cutting their mustaches small. So it wouldn't, wouldn't clock, wouldn't uh, hurt the gas masks. After the war, Hitler kept that mustache. And so he's a, the show he's a veteran. That's why the, you, you think of the Hitler mustache. That's why he's a veteran. All right. I'm going to give you one more day to do, do this map. And so have the map on Saturday. Come in Saturday morning. What time? 4 a.m.? It's about 4 a.m. Wait outside. If I'm not here, wait for me. I'll be here. Just wait. Just wait. I'll, 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 I'll be here. I might be an hour or two. But I'll give you some money. Yeah, you go. Um, Let me get the live. Yeah. Uh, Portugal like would eventually. Portugal would eventually join the Allied Spain Sea. And what about Sweden? Sweden and Norway stay neutral until the demo. And Albania, for the most part, stayed neutral. Like Luxembourg and Belgium were technically neutral, but since Germany took them. Germany. Yeah, they, they stayed neutral first, but they would become out. Yeah. What else does Matt say? Yes. I'll put one of these now. Okay, so, 1740, they should, this really, want this out? Uh -oh. 1740? Yes. <laughs> here. This one's only about 12 years old. This one's about 20. That one's about 40. That was more than that. That's about 50 years old on this. This this map either was here when capital was first explored, or when it might have been or some. That's all about it. They they basically built this wall, but it's so expensive they couldn't keep going. So it laid empty here for two years. And then the school district bought it, it's on the high school. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and they expanded it. Like this part was built, the part we're sitting was built in so many years. I'm older than that. Thanks for seeing a little bit of crowd with that. Oh, Yeah. Cyprus was a British colony. Is that what the Yeah. Yeah, this was 1920. Uh, <laughs> And Austria, 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 it's actually so amazing all the stuff that's going to happen. It is? It is. Yeah. Rayon. Yeah. I'm so tired of people cheating with color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Russian Empire is gone. And it's going to become eventually the USSR. And the last one. What do you have? I'm saying I'm very. I'm going to be so funny. That's like so funny. Thank you. German Tower Republic. Still there, but yeah. Great Britain is a. Great Britain is basically this. And then the UK was the United Kingdom of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And so that became the United Kingdom. And now it's England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. But now that's, and so I, everyone, it's pretty common to refer to the country of Great Britain, but technically it's you. That's more, that's actually more technical. Okay. But, but Britain is the whole thing. Ireland or England is sorry, England is sorry. What's happening? Well, it. But it's not part of the uh, kingdom. I think it was the kingdom of England, Scotland. Oh, thank you. Oh, Wales, but they just think about the English and Wales. There's still a lot of reason. Very good reason. <laughs> Um, I it some way. It does need to be. Yeah. Yeah. But this you know, it'll be an hour. Yeah. Italy. I know I put out 1914, but it's kind of the war. I didn't know how, really how else to yeah. And it was, it was not neat. It was just neat. And you can, you can see the roots of World War II in the end of World War I. Not you can see. The roots of World War II are in the end of World War I. And Japan is going to be very bitter about this. Japan will join the Allies. So tomorrow, kind of stuff, I'm going to do the movie. I have a great movie called, the, a great video called The Killing Fields about the war. I know it sounds horrible, but it fits in very well with what the war was. It's, it's fantastic. You will like it. Got it? You won't like it. So I don't know if I'm going to show that tomorrow or talk about 1914. I'll, I'll, I'll decide tomorrow. I'll make sure. I'll try to do it on. Yeah. Oh, and you'll notice one thing. I'm going to steal this very quickly. I made the worksheet for the video. The print is very small. And the reason why is I know all of you are. It's small print, right? You are both. In fact, you are young and or smart. One of the two you should have the resource, correct? Mm 
Cut down on the electric stuff. Yeah. 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 Those are those are uh, the parts of the question. They would they would render it independence for a small while we plan to and then so we can well what's going to become the so yes Tom. Yeah, so Finland Finland actually won their independence at the end of 1917 so they're considered post post okay. Oh, and one more country. We have to ask. Ireland would win their independence. Ireland won their independence, but not all. In, yeah, and it's still an issue. In fact, it was just in the paper today because of when Britain left the European Union. Yes. Thank you for all that training. Oh, I should have one thing. Since we're talking about this, we have all the population, uh, you know, all different people. The vast majority of Jews in the world. Almost none of them. This is what we call shadows. So what's the math do? Saturday, 4 a.m. I might even boil up some stones for you. See a big cauldron bubbling away. And the best kind of boil. Yeah, you just what you do is you put flour and yeast and just baking soda and butter, seven or eight pounds of sugar, chocolate. Uh, lettuce, and then you just let it boil. You don't miss it, you just boil it, and it comes out beautiful stuff. It's, it's, it's physics. See you tomorrow. I won't. Where are you going tomorrow? I'm Okay. Oh, so she hit right at the beginning of co or yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, she was one that we went to. I just saw your videos. Oh yeah, because your mother was doing it. <laughs> 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 91 though. Hey, then 91? Where were you yesterday? I'm not playing for me. That's the one. Yeah. I've been waiting all day for you to get here. People like to do no shame. So, quick yeah. question. So, they all want to do that. And there is actually not a good defense system. And so, I like that one. It's a Well, we could be talking about some of the parties. Okay. Okay. So it hurts way more than it should be. There's no way it should bring back the thing. There's no business being that engaged. I made it work with the hand. And it worked with the elbow. You know, I played one game of chance. It was so good. And it was a potato. Oh, six feet. Yeah, there are two I've never seen. Why not? Yeah, Beach Boy, yeah, Beach Boy and then it kind of culminated. Beach Boy 70s music, Terry Milk without the producer holding out. Yeah. 
Yes, get, get some paper. All right, we're going to do a few notes and I'll give you time to do the reading. I'm sorry, not the reading, the uh, math. So it's mostly being down to 15 below tomorrow tonight and then as high as 20 tomorrow. If it does that, that's a 35 degree difference. That's from the door. I didn't even play for downside. You're back for more? Where's my bag? I think Aiden might have been all right. Aiden did. Yeah. All right, make sure you didn't tell me. No, that's fine. Thank you. Is there anything else? Is it above the table? I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, but. If there's anything you think, oh, good. But uh, if there's any issue, I'll be more than happy to me. Bear with me. Look at this. I'm very thank you. All righty then. <laughs> we filmed all this. I'm so excited for. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Even though I know everything about Carl Hansen, a master of stuff. It's such an interesting character. Go to the front. Uh, I'm kicking you out. I've had enough of this, Mark. And then the two things. Oh, yeah. I just want to like look. Yeah. All right, so let's do a few notes and then we'll get to, and I'll give you time to do the math. Okay, well, that's all right. Whatever. Yeah. And, um, awesome. Check my map. That map's about 10, 20, 28. I'm not going to give it up. Don't go with me when I quit. Actually, those are great maps. They, that company that makes that, those maps, they, are, they don't make maps. Went out of business, which is too bad. They were the best maps. Those are okay. And I have more here. I like maps. I never want to be short of maps. We're jumping right in. So World War One ended, World War Two, Vietnam. Let's do practice tests for the rest of the year. You don't get to see the dog. Let's do a few notes and we'll go from there. What do we finish? We get to uh, the mobilization. Ah, mobilization. Right here? Yeah. Oh, perfect. So what was the super battleship? Dreadnought. And did anyone go out to Canyon Bureau? It's kind of cold, but go look at my dreadnought. The yacht base didn't use anything there. It's for, it's about 41,000 tons. I want a dreadnought. If you ever get a chance to go on a dreadnought, they would call them battleships after the war. They're expensive. They're really cool. I report 